Well, Shalom, Mishpacha, friends, family, and Messiah. Um, I briefly went over this whole article yesterday in one of my other videos, but I didn't have a chance to really go through it because I was addressing uh, a separate issue in that video, and I, I wasn't trying to, to veer off course too terribly much, but... I do want to take the time to um, go through this article because this has just been weighing very heavily on my heart uh, all day today. And, you know, we got my mom's uh, townhouse uh, all finished off and got the keys turned in. And, and uh, me and my sister, you know, had to run some errands this morning and, and, you know, there's still a few few last final, final details, you know, that I got to take care of uh, as far as my mom is concerned. But the main things are, are done. And so now I can finally feel like uh, my life can semi get back to, to normal. And so I want to go through this this article because it's it's very, very grievous. And this is just another kind of attack on God's word, okay? So this article, and, and I will leave the link for all of you uh, who may wish to come and read through this yourself or, you know, check out maybe some of, you know, the, the other articles or, or the archives um, for your own study and research. It's uh, called The Baptist Pillar, and it comes from Canada, okay? says Canada's only true Baptist paper, okay? And then they've got up here, 1 Timothy 3.15, the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Now, what I want to do is find out what translation uh, this is in before we get started. Okay, well, um, without uh, seeing the beginning of the verse, it looks like it could be one of, of two translations possibly and this is uh just on um biblehub.com okay the church of the living god the pillar and ground of the truth okay the church of the living god the pillar and ground of the truth the pillar and ground of the truth okay um or it could be the New Heart English Bible, the Church of the Living God, the Pillar and Ground of the Truth. Okay, so um, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, could also be from the King James 2000 Bible, uh, the American King James Version. Uh, Let's see, the Church of the Living God, the Pillar and Ground of the Truth. This could be the ASV version. Again, without seeing the beginning of the verse, it's it's really, uh, or it could even be the Dure Reims Bible. It's 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 too hard to um, to tell. It could even be the uh, the E the ERV, the English Revised Version. Okay. So, um, it starts off with, there is no final authority but God. Okay, well, we do know that there is, uh, you know, absolute truth, okay? That absolute truth does lie in, in Yahweh, okay? But now, has he given us his absolute truth? So that we know what that absolute truth is. Okay? Well, I believe that our scriptures, the KJV, is that um, that that standard. Okay? And the King James was used to <clears throat> translate most of the uh, different world languages. Now, I realize before the uh, King James Version, you had um, like Wycliffe and, and some of the others. They were um, like a, a stepping stone to what we would now have as the KJV. Okay. Now, to say that we've, you know, 
never had God's word even before the KJV, that's false too, okay? Because before, you know, Wycliffe, Tyndale, God always had his word available to us. You know, it was in the Masoretic text or the, um, the Hebrew, the Greek, okay? So there was always a way that we could know what Yahweh's absolute truth is, okay? So, yes, the final authority is God. He has that final authority, okay? Now, Scripture does tell us that God is a spirit, absolutely. It says there is no final authority that can be seen, heard, read, felt, or handled, okay? Now, the thing to keep in mind is, this is an article written by a man. Is this man above God? No, he's not. He is no more above God in his opinions or uh, assertions than I am. Okay? Now, he does reference um, a few scriptures. Okay? But the majority of this is just his own you know, quote unquote, dot connection. Okay. Now, I personally believe that the KJV is the final authority. Okay. Now, he goes on to say, since all books are material, there is no book on this earth that is the final and absolute authority on what is right and what is wrong, what constitutes truth and what constitutes error. Okay, this is deceptive and this is false, okay, because why do we even have laws, you know, just in the United States? We have laws of, you know, not committing murder and, you know, divorce laws on adultery. Uh, we have laws on stealing and and everything which where do we think that these laws came from it came from the bible okay so this man is speaking out of his own mouth he's basically you know saying oh just do what thou wilt you know Whatever is right in your own eyes, whatever is wrong in your own eyes, that's truth for you. But it may not constitute truth or error for me. So what this does is it's his way of not being accountable for his actions if we really do not have. God's word in written form, okay? Well, that's what Satan would like us to think, isn't it? You know, all the way back into the garden. Did God really say, hath God said, yeah, you know, do as thou wilt. You know, this is occultic. This is satanic thinking here, okay? This is Luciferian. Well, if this statement is true, that there is no book on this earth that is the final and absolute authority on what is right and what is wrong, what constitutes truth and what constitutes error, what does that mean? Well, it means that, you know, we have a complete breakdown of society because one person might think, oh, murders, you know, there's nothing wrong with murder, you know, depending on how they were raised and what kind of ethics and morals they were raised with. Another one says, no, murder's wrong. Okay, well, you have a complete breakdown of society, and boy, don't we see that now. Don't we see that now? If everybody just has the mindset of do as thou wilt, okay? Well, who, uh, who instituted that statement? Okay, and if I'm pronouncing this right, it's called Thelema, okay? Um, 
uh, long E as in seed. Uh, Philomel, maybe? Okay, well, it's a religion based on philosophical law of the same name adopted as a central tenet by some religious organizations. The law of Philema is do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Love is the law, love under will. The law of Philema was developed in the early 1900s by Alistair Crowley, an English writer and ceremonial magician. He believed himself to be the prophet of a new age, the uh, Aeon of Horus, based upon a spiritual experience that he and his wife had in Egypt in 1904. Okay? This is a, an absolute wicked, wicked man. Okay? And there's their little logo. Uh, it's a unicursal hexagram. And, yeah, it's an important symbol in this thelema. Okay? Um, yeah. You know, the philosophy also emphasizes the ritual practice of magic. Okay? Well, let's see what Scripture has to say about do as thou wilt. Okay, well, doing a Google search, I believe the first mention of this is in Judges 17. Okay? And it talks about uh, a man of Mount Ephraim whose name was Micah, you know, and he said unto his mother, the 1100 shekels of silver that were taken from thee, about which thou cursest and spakest of also in mine ear, behold, the silver is with me, I took it. And his mother said, blessed be thou of the Lord, my son. And when she had restored the 1100 shekels of silver to his mother, his mother said, I have wholly dedicated the silver unto the Lord. From my hand for my son to make a graven image and a molten image now therefore i will restore it unto thee okay so what what she's doing she thinks she's dedicating it to the lord by making a graven image and a molten image one of the ten commandments is have no graven images remember what happened with the golden calf Yet he restored the money unto his mother, and his mother took 200 shekels of silver and gave them to the founder who made thereof a graven image and a molten image, and they were in the house of Micah. And the man Micah had an house of gods and made an ephod and a teraphim and consecrated one of his sons who became his priest. In those days there, were no, there was no king in Israel, but Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Do what thou wilt. And then again, we see it repeated in Judges 21, 25. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Okay, well, this is not how Yahweh uh wants things to be because what's right in my eyes may not be absolute truth in Yahweh's eyes and he's the absolute authority in this and if he can't lay down his commandments his rules his house rule number one we don't know what he constitutes as sin so how do we even know? I mean, if there's no, you know, final authority in a written word, how do we even know that Jesus Christ is our Redeemer, our Messiah? I mean, there's no way of knowing, is there? And so when people say that, you know, the Bible is not the word of God, well, that's denying Jesus Christ because without the Bible, you would not know about who Jesus Christ is, would you? No, you wouldn't. Okay, so this man's mindset, just starting off within the first few lines of this, is uh, of this Thelema religious mindset, a false religion. He's following after the works of Aleister Crowley. Then he goes on to say, there was a series of writings one time which, if they had been 
if they had all been put into a book as soon as they were written the first time would have constituted an infallible and final authority by which to judge truth and error. Okay, well, let's talk about that. Okay, now, we may not have the original, but how precise are the, uh, the Jewish scribes in making copies of, of scripture? I mean, this is a very precise thing. I mean, they're very, very tedious. Okay, well, here's the process of copying the Old Testament by Jewish scribes. Because it was the Jewish people that were given the oracles of God, which preserved it so that we have it now. In 586 BC, Jerusalem was captured by the Babylonians. The temple was looted and then destroyed by fire. The Jews were exiled. About 70 years later, the Jewish captives returned to Jerusalem from Babylon. According to the Bible, Ezra recovered a copy of the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and read it aloud to the whole nation. From then on, the Jewish scribes solidified the following process for creating copies of the Torah and eventually other books in the Old Testament. Number one, they could use only clean animal skins, both to write on and even to bind manuscripts. Two, each column of writing could have no less than 48 and no more than 60 lines. Three, the ink must be black and of a special recipe. Four, they must verbalize each word aloud while they were writing. They must wipe the pen and wash their entire bodies before writing the word Jehovah every time they wrote it. There must be a review within 30 days, and if as many as three pages required corrections, the entire manuscript had to be redone. The letters, words, and paragraphs had to be counted. The document became invalid if two letters touched each other. The middle paragraph, word, and letter must correspond to those of the original document. The documents could be stored only in sacred places like synagogues, etc. As no document containing God's word could be destroyed, they were stored or buried in a uh, geniza, which is a Hebrew term meaning hiding place. These were usually kept in a synagogue or sometimes in a Jewish cemetery. The final item is why we have no original manuscripts of the Old Testament today, because they were put in hiding places. Okay. Um, after Jerusalem was sacked by Rome in the first century, the process was lost. While a Hebrew version of the Old Testament continued to exist, the language wasn't spoken by many. Greek and eventually Latin versions continued to be copied. Okay, well, how accurate were the scribes? Beginning in the 6th century and into the 10th century AD, some European Jewish scribes continued a similar method for copying manuscripts of the Old Testament in the original Hebrew language as originated by the scribes before Christ. Until 1948, the oldest manuscripts of the Old Testament dated back to 895 AD. In 1947, a shepherd boy discovered some scrolls inside a cave west of the Dead Sea. These manuscripts dated between 100 B.C. and 100 A.D. Over the next decade, more scrolls were found in caves, and the discovery became known as the Dead Sea Scrolls. Okay, now I'm not going to go into the Dead Sea Scrolls, okay? But, you know, this lets us know God has made a way for us to have his word, okay? Every book in the Old Testament was represented in this discovery except Esther. Numerous copies of each book were discovered, for example, 25 copies of Deuteronomy. While there are other items found among the Dead Sea Scrolls, not currently in the Old Testament, the Old Testament items that were found have few discrepancies to the versions from the 10th century. While not perfect, this is our best measuring stick to how accurate the Jewish scribes were throughout the centuries. Okay, now, I know that there's, uh, you know, a lot of talk about... Uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, okay? That's not the point of this article. This is just to show you how tedious they were when they would be 
copying uh, the Holy Scriptures, okay? So for this pastor, quote-unquote pastor, false pastor, to word it like this is bringing doubt and confusion to um, what Scripture has to say about this, okay? However, the series of writings was lost. And the God who inspired them was unable to preserve their content through Bible-believing Christians at Antioch, where the first Bible teachers were. The first Bible teachers? Okay. Um, I guess he doesn't consider the Old Testament scripture then, right? Were not the prophets Bible teachers? Yes, they were. Okay, and where the first missionary trip originated, and where the word Christian originated. This is total deception. It really, really is. So God chose to almost preserve them through Gnostics and philosophers from Alexandria, Egypt, even though God called his son out of Egypt in Matthew 2, Jacob out of Egypt in Genesis 49, Israel out of Egypt in Exodus 15, and Joseph's bones out of Egypt, Exodus 13. Well, he doesn't believe that we have any way of knowing what, what is real and what isn't real, so how does he know that God really called his son out of Egypt in Matthew 2? I mean, if we're just going to be all honest here. So God just almost preserved them. This is a lie from the pit of hell. And he did it through Gnostics and philosophers from Alexandria, Egypt. Yeah. God chose to preserve his word through Gnostic philosophers that teach damnable heresy. Yeah. That's a really good God, isn't it? If you believe this man. So there are two streams of Bibles. According to him, the most accurate, though, of course, there is no final absolute authority for determining truth and error. It is a manner of preference, matter of preference, are the Egyptian translations from Alexandria, Egypt. This is your Nessel, your corrupted translations, which are almost the originals, although not quite. Okay? The most inaccurate translations were those that were brought about the German Reformation, Luther, you know, all these guys, and the worldwide missionary movement of the English-speaking people. The Bible that Sunday, Tory, Moody, Finney, Spurgeon, Whitefeld, Wesley, and Chapman used. Let's see what, uh, what, uh, translations these guys use because we know what translations these are this is your ESV your NIV probably your New King James version okay well let's do a little bit of research here together okay this is on Luther's Bible okay um, while well, he was sequestered in the uh, Wartburg Castle, from 1521 to 22, Luther began to translate the New Testament from Koine Greek into German in order to make it more accessible to all the people of the Holy Roman Empire of the German nation. He translated from the Greek text using Erasmus' second edition, 1519, of the Greek New Testament, known as the Textus Receptus. And the Textus Receptus is the name given to the succession of printed Greek texts of the New Testament. The term Textus Receptus may also apply to other ancient texts in other languages, traditionally copied and passed down by scribes. The biblical Textus Receptus constituted the translation base for the original German Luther Bible, the translation of the New Testament into English by William Tyndale, the King James Version, the Spanish uh, translation, the Russian Bible and most Reformation era, era New Testament translations throughout Western and Central Europe. Okay. Um, 
Yeah. So what uh, he's saying basically is the Textus Receptus is the most inaccurate translation. But your Alexandria, Egypt ones are the most accurate. Uh, no, not at all. It omits words like you wouldn't believe. But then he finishes off. But we can tolerate these if those who believe in them will tolerate us. What, just go along to get along, right? After all, since there is no absolute and final authority that anyone can read, teach, preach, or handle, the whole thing is a matter of preference. You may prefer what you prefer, and we will prefer what we prefer. Let us live in peace. And if we cannot agree on anything or everything, let us all agree on one thing. There is no final, absolute, written authority of God anywhere on this earth. Biggest lie from the pit of hell. It really, really is. Okay, so we're going to go back and we're going to see what Scripture actually tells us. Uh, about, you know, was God able to uh, preserve his uh, his content through Bible-believing Christians? You know, I mean, this is absolutely false to say that there were no Bible teachers before uh, the New Testament. That means because they've just thrown out all of the Old Testament. Yeah, and they throw out all of God's laws, too. Where do you think we get our laws for the different countries that we live in? Comes from the Bible. Okay? Psalms 12. The words of the Lord are pure words, a silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. But if you already don't believe, that the Bible is the final authority, then you've got a problem. Because if you find out that you're wrong and then you are then judged by this same word, it's gonna it's not gonna go well for you. Because he's saying he is going to preserve them from this generation forever. Why do you think we've always had his word? He's made sure that we've always had a way to know what he says to us in written form. And no wonder, because the wicked walk on every side when the vilest men are exalted. Like this man right here. Yeah. Um, 2 Timothy 3, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Not only is he deceiving, but he is also deceived as well. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Okay. This is all scripture, Old Testament and New Testament. All of it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. This man is causing so much error and confusion, and he will give an account for this unless he repents of this. So, okay, um, just wanted to uh, take the time to, to really go over this because this is really, really bad. If you don't have faith, 
in the word of God, you have nothing. Because you don't even believe that God can preserve his word. You've put God in a box. You've limited him. You've made him a non-perfect God. You've made, you, you've made him to be just like you. Someone that is a God that's fallible, not perfect. All right, guys, so with that, I'll go ahead and close out and bid you all blessings and shalom.